So just to let everyone know, this event will be recorded in speaker mode of the three active speakers, myself, Anthony, and Rachel, and just posted to YouTube as a resource, the benefit of doing these Zoom events, you know, that we can save them for people who might later be interested. And yes, yeah, so just to welcome everyone, hello. Thank you for coming to this event entitled Progressive Yiddish Art and Politics, Past and Present. My name is Sarah Biskowitz. I'm a senior at Smith College. I'm a Jewish studies major and leader in the Smith College Jewish community. And we're so glad you've all joined us virtually. And I inv invite you, if you would like, to add where you are joining us from to your Zoom display name. I know we have, I was saying, rabbis, professors, students, musicians, activists, people of all ages from Canada, France, America, uh, maybe more. So thank you so much for coming. And, you know, uh, I am located in Western Mass and it's great to have everyone here from all over. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by the Smith College Jewish Community, the Smith College Center for Religious and Spiritual Life, and the Smith College Department of Jewish Studies. And just to let you know a little bit about each of those groups, the Smith College Jewish Community is a student-led organization that fosters Jewish community among Smith students. We are supported by our Jewish student advisor, Rabbi Rhonda Reeser Shapiro, and the Smith College Center for Religious and Spiritual Life which is an interreligious non-denominational body that promotes spiritual flourishing for all students, religious and non-religious alike. The Smith College Jewish Studies Department has a strong tradition of scholarship on Yiddish language and culture, and its alums have gone on to programs, fellowships, and even leadership positions at Yiddish institutions, including our neighbor in Amherst, the Yiddish Book Center. And now to briefly introduce our speakers today. And there's much more that they've accomplished that I'm excited to get to in our conversation, but just to give you a general idea, Anthony Russell is a vocalist, composer, and arranger specializing in Yiddish song. He has performed solo and with other celebrated artists in many venues across North America and Europe. In 2017, Anthony, an accordionist and pianist, Dimitri Gaskin, won the Yiddish Idol competition in Mexico City, eventually forming a duo, Sve Breeder, or Two Brothers, for the composition and performance of new songs in the Yiddish language. He has also performed with Ladino singer, singer Sarah Aroeste. In 2018, in collaboration with the Klezmer concert Beretsky Pass, he released the album Convergence, which explores the sounds of 100 years of African-American and Ashkenazi Jewish music. And last spring, Anthony worked with several other Yiddishists to form the Black Lives Matter Terms in Yiddish Google Doc. Rachel Kafrizen is a journalist, cultural critic, and playwright. Her work on new Yiddish culture, feminism, and contemporary Jewish life has appeared in many publications, including Haaretz, The Jewish Week, The Forward, Hey Alma, Lilith, and the Digital Yiddish Theater Project, among others. Since 2017, she has been writing a twice monthly column for Tablet Magazine called Golden City, which focuses on Yiddish and Ashkenazi life in all its incarnate incarnations. She also maintains a blog called Yiddish pra Praxis and was awarded a prestigious 2019-2020 LABA, or L-A-B-A, I don't know how to say it, <laughs> LABA Fellowship at the 14th Street Y in New York City, for which she wrote a play entitled, entitled Stumer Shabbos or Silent Sabbath. Anthony and Rachel will be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A for about 15 minutes, and you will have the opportunity to write questions in the chat uh, for the Q&A at the end. Please begin your questions with two question marks so I can easily see them in the chat. So welcome, Rachel and Anthony. And I know we wanted to give the audience a little taste of some of the many things you've created uh, before we dive into discussing them. So I invite you, if you'd like to introduce yourself further and also to share with us uh, what you've prepared. Okay, Anthony, you wanna go first? Yeah, I can go first. Um, I thought what I would do is read a short excerpt from an essay that I wrote earlier this year for Jewish Currents entitled Translating Black Lives Matter into Yiddish. Over the past couple of days, I've had to consider who a phrase like Afro-Americana Lebens seinen wichtig is for. Perhaps it's for people who want to express their solidarity with the sanctity of Black life. 
in a language that they have reclaimed or perhaps have always spoken. Perhaps it is for Ashkenazi Jews who have begun to do the work of eroding the effects of American racism, or for those who have persisted in doing the work and would like to see it as continuous with the work of previous Yiddish speaking generations. Curiously, as I write this, I realize that among all these worthy people, this phrase is for me, for someone who has previously avoided making any bold self-assertions in his adopted language of paranose, livelihood, and artistic self-expression. I've done so much living through the Yiddish language, and now I have words to declare that this living, this life, matters. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to read something that is uh, a lot less concise. Um, and Sarah, I think we're going to share a little clip, a uh, video clip first to introduce you. You want to preface it? Do you want me to play it? Um, well, so it's, uh, mm, it's, it's, let's say it's a piece of music that I'm going to talk about a little bit, and it's a good introduction to get your mind into uh, the subject matter. Let's put it that way. In this house, there's some wars in this house. There's some wars in this house. There's some wars in this house. I said certified free. Seven days a week. Wet and gushy. Make that pullout game weak. Yeah, you tellin' with some wet and gushy. Bring a bucket and a mop for this wet and gushy. Give me everything you got for this wet and gushy. Beat it up, baby, catch a charge. Extra large and extra hard. Put this cookie right in your face. Swipe your nose like a credit card. Hop on top, I wanna ride. I do a giggle, I'm kinda wild. Look at my mouth, look at my thighs. This water is wet, come take a dive. Time Okay, so this is going to be slightly uh, PG-13+, plus, let's say, as the ice cream truck drives by my window again. This is a piece that spans two New York summers, and if you've ever spent a summer in New York, you know that the humidity is inescapable and tends to color your perceptions. In the summer of 2019, I was at the YIVO summer program where I took a literature class with Miriam Trin. There we read a poem by Celia Dropkin, which had the title, Du quellst ich quell, or I swell, you swell. In it, a woman addresses her lover. Nail my hands and feet to a cross, she says, consume the whole of me. The poem is full of startlingly erotic imagery and it got me thinking about the Yiddish verb kvelin and its American afterlife. Kvelling has become the quintessential Yinglish verb signifying everything cozy and right within the Jewish habitus. But when I looked up kvelin in the Yiddish dictionary, I found that the verb contains two distinctly antithetical connotations. The first relates to swelling or gushing. The second means to torture or suffer. Kvelin, to kvel, is in fact a contronym, a word which comprises two opposite meanings, like in English, cleave and sanction. This is because Middle High German, the precursor language to Yiddish, contained two distinct differently spelled words, one relating to water and swelling, the other related to torture and pain. By a linguistic quirk, these two different words ultimately merged into the Yiddish homonym, kvelin. In Yiddish, both meanings of kvelin are utterly commonplace and can be found everywhere. But in English, the second more uncomfortable kvel is entirely absent. The fact that there's a popular Jewish parenting site called Kfeller with no asterisk to disambiguate this Kfell from its evil twin speaks for itself. In February, 2020, Kfeller dedicated a whole article to the art of Kfelling, saying Kfelling is not boasting or bragging, it's quieter. It's the pride you feel when you witness your older child patiently helping the younger one finish a puzzle. It's also the satisfaction you feel because it means they might have been listening to you after all. So let's go back to Celia Dropkin's Du quellst ich quell. Du quellst ich quell, es quellt in uns der Gott, was macht von alts a tell, was weiß nicht von verbot. You swell, I swell, within us falls a God, which makes of everything a ruin and knows nothing of forbidden. The narrator of the poem asks her lover to nail her to a cross, to consume her, to suck every drop from her and walk away. 
In American Jewish English, kvel has been shrunken down in connotation, reduced to taking pride in one's children or its association with motherhood more generally. But as we see, Dropkin infuses kvel with a much more primal vulnerability, one in which kvel can mean an uncontrollable gushing of desire, of emotion, of the stickiness of human procreation. Kvelen also carries this paradoxical second meaning to torment or torture, introducing a masochistic question to the verse. How then to translate Dropkin's Kvel? For my own translation, I like the mamosha stick, the substantial quality of swell, but even swell loses the erotic dampness of Kvelin's connotations of gushiness. I was sad but not surprised when I saw one male translator had gone with overjoyed for Dropkin's Kvel. With all due respect, not every Yiddish poem must be rendered safe for the front of the family fridge. Which brings me to the summer of 2020. Whether you were listening to the radio or right-wing talk shows, everyone was suddenly talking about gushiness. Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion had dropped their single called WAP, W-A-P. As you heard earlier, the radio-friendly edit of the song was changed to Wet and Gushy perhaps the only cleaned up single version to end up that much filthier than the original. The nation's mostly male pearl clutchers were predictably alarmed at two women insisting on their own pleasure and profiting from it too. Celia Dropkin too had her share of pearl clutchers. Reviewing Dropkin's sole published collection of poetry in 1935, the most important literary critic of the day, the writer now known as Samuel Charney dismissed Dropkin's work as insufficiently political. He said, it irks me that she included in her books things that were important only for her and not for the reader. Even Tarney, a sensitive reader who himself pioneered a Yiddish literary theory which centered female readers, even he could not imagine the female readers who would find female pleasure important. Dropkin's vision of the feminine quell was to say the least ahead of its time, unlimited as it was by male or American ideas of appropriateness, whether literary or otherwise. Her poetry imagined a female subject whose kvel was not passive, not centered on the achievements of her family or her community. Dropkin's kvel was a messy flood of feelings which could not be contained by either pleasure or pain, one which you might say demanded both a bucket, a bucket and a mop. If, as Kveller tells us, anyone can and should master the art of Kvelling, Celia Dropkin challenged us to expand the boundaries of the word itself. I would suggest that this must include taking Yiddish seriously as a Jewish language, making sure students in Jewish schools have the resources to study it if they want to, and ultimately to reclaim the mess and contradictions of Jewish American life, which defy easy translation. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Lots to think about. Um, just I have, to, oh, I have go to ahead. mention the fact that the sample that's used uh, throughout that song, there's some whores in this house. I uh, had said that that was a rather concise synopsis of Sholem Ash's play, Gottfu Nekome. Um, and perhaps that was actually where the video took place, but you know, that's a midrash, so you don't have to take it seriously. <laughs> See, this is why Anthony and I are friends, because you know. <laughs> Well, before you were able to make extremely excellent comparisons between pop culture today and Yiddish plays of the past, I'm wondering um, what sparked both of your involvement with Yiddish language and culture? Anthony, why don't you go first? Oh, goodness. I feel like I should let you go first because mine's rather long and discursive. Um, <laughs> previous to becoming a performer of Yiddish almost nine years ago, um, I'm unsure whether I really had any sort of personal connection to Yiddish other than a very limited vocabulary of words which I could use to spice up um, kind of an interaction that I was having with somebody. I remember when I was 21 using the phrase crazy mashugana and somebody who had the knowledge um, told me that that was basically a tautology. <laughs> So um, that might have been the very first person who um, corrected my Yiddish usage at the young age of 21. Um, beyond that, beyond various words that I had to look up from one of my favorite television shows, The Nanny, I really didn't have any sort of engagement with uh, the Yiddish language as such. Initially, as a performer of Yiddish, 
my experience of it was almost solely through the experiences of others, which meant that its contexts were very familial and something that was possessed in a very sort of Hamish way. It was a Hamish sort of ownership. Um, I knew as a performer that I wanted a language of Jewish expression that had considerable historical precedents and culture, but also had slightly less epic dimensions rhetorically than, than Hebrew had. And I think that's because my context for Hebrew was solely in shul. Um, I think my entire life instinctually, I've been sort of sifting through the meaning of being in diaspora as a black American and Yiddish language and culture presented itself to me as a sort of curious parallel to my wanderings through kind of black diasporic culture. So that was kind of some of the things that informed my initial experience and kind of searching out of, of Yiddish as a language, kind of what it did for me initially. Okay. Um, so I grew up on Long Island and uh, in a very Jewish atmosphere, but not a very terribly Yiddish atmosphere at all. Um, I didn't have a lot of contact with grandparents. I had one living grandparent who I didn't have much contact with. And <clears throat> there wasn't much Yiddish around me either in the environment or in my family. There was a little bit. There were these breadcrumb, this breadcrumb trail of Yiddish words, which I just sort of took for granted. Um, and, uh, you know, at the very vulnerable and impressionable age, I think of about 16 or 17, my entire world was changed when my dad brought home a Klezmer CD. And, uh, you know, that was it. That was not just a light bulb moment, but uh, it really kind of blew my mind that, because I saw the world very much through music. I, I was very musically oriented. Um, my identity, I would say, was very much about music. You know, I was a Beatles fan. Like that was really a really important uh, part of who I was. And then, I, you know, there I was at this age where you're trying to figure out who you are in this larger sense. And I realized that there was this really incredible, cool music I had never heard before. And that was in this weird language that was actually more than just Meshugana and, you know, um, other words we won't say, but it, there was this entire culture. And I just was absolutely obsessed. And it was the days before the internet where you could just find anything. So uh, I went on a sort of scavenger hunt for Yiddish. And I decided I had to go to a school that where I could study Yiddish. So I went to Brandeis and, and I did that. Of course, you couldn't major in British, uh, in Yiddish. I majored in French, but um, that was kind of it. it. It was really very much my awakening to Yiddish was tied up with the uh, high point of the so-called, I don't know, second wave of the Klezmer revival, specifically the um, Klezmer Conservatory Band and the Klezmatics. And beyond that, those first explorations with Yiddish and that initial pull, since you both have created so much in this world and been around for a while, I'm wondering how your connection to Yiddish has evolved. Um, well, yes, my connection to Yiddish has evolved tremendously. And I would say in certain ways it's evolved in a kind of almost predictable path that now that I see people 20 years younger than I am getting into Yiddish, it goes along certain, uh, I would say, certain steps. Um, and, you know, when I started learning Yiddish, to me, it was very much about like, oh, wow, there's all these, this cool politics and, uh, you know, I didn't know about this and the labor movement and Yiddish anarchists and all these things. And it's like so exciting because it's everything that growing up on, in a middle-class neighborhood on Long Island is not. So there's that exploration of like, oh, wow, they were keeping this from me. And, you know, being Jewish can mean something totally different than what I previously understood it to be. And then there's kind of, for me, certainly there was um, a process of assimilating all these things and really coming to a much deeper understanding of Jewish history. And Yiddish was a, an entree into that. So I would say that it, it led me into this really much, much deeper experience of Yiddish and also led me to 
sort of step away from a kind of overdetermined approach to what Yiddish is. Yiddish is not a language of protest or Yiddish is this or Yiddish is that. Like Yiddish is a language. <laughs> I think um, initially what Yiddish was for me was a language, in, as I said before, a language in which I can sort of express myself, um, a Jewish language specifically, um, and one that was comprised of sounds uh, with which I was relatively comfortable having formerly been a, a performer of German. Um, but what it eventually became was more, it became a format for me to instantly connect with my audiences in very direct and very personal ways that I was unable to do um, when I was singing on the operatic stage. Um, I think my concept of it as a language changed over time as I felt more empowered to have my own opinions about Yiddish as a language as opposed to adopting the very sort of facile and easy narratives that one receives about Yiddish. Um, and it's been complicated because um, being empowered to have an opinion about Yiddish as a black man means that occasionally you will give your opinion about that. And being a black man off the bat already means that uh, your opinions on the subject are, are especially in question. Um, it's interesting that um, Yiddish really gave me the ability to travel a lot um, across various parts of the world. And what it presented to me was Yiddish both as an international language and as an international culture, as a cosmopolitan phenomenon. And I think um, because I was able to experience it um, in these particular contexts, it affected the way in which I performed Yiddish and the things that I did in Yiddish. Um, having a physical experience of kind of the international quality of Yiddish or the borderless quality of Yiddish, and also doing some reading and some researching about kind of that phenomenon of, its, of the international character of Yiddish really inspired me to begin creating work that made more sense on an international stage or wore its internationality on its sleeve, as opposed to considering Yiddish in this very parochial, um, you know, I live next door to, you know, Seitel kind of <laughs> uh, context in which, you know, Yiddish is so often sort of shoved into. So that, yeah, I mean, it's definitely changed. I think, um, if you ever want to have a really good time, you can go to my website and you can look at my earliest uh, interviews uh, about the fact that I was a performer in the Yiddish language circa 2011, 2012. And I have very facile and very sort of stereotypical things to say about the language. And then like over the course of about nine years, you see it change as my experiences of being a performer in the language and interacting with other people in the language and around the language and around the culture changes my view of what the language actually is. I made a joke about uh, Emily and Gullis where uh, 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 Emily in Paris is like this thing that everyone's talking about now. And like the whole idea is that there's this young woman and she's kind of bumbling her way linguistically and physically through um, Paris and I think part of the reason why I made the Emily and Gullis joke where I basically superimposed a uh, stramel on top of her head instead of um, her French beret is that on some level, I felt like Emily and Gullis. Like I had to go through a number of extremely awkward linguistic experiences with people before I felt like I really had any footing in Gullis, which is this sort of country that we are all not all of us, but many of us are sort of schlepping and bumbling through. So um, I think that that probably informed a little bit of my, my joking there. And both of you, I think what gives you the fans that you have, and many are here today, and many people here today will become your fans, is how resonant you can create these pieces of art and 
Rachel journalism uh, to today, but I've noticed that a lot of both of your work really looks back towards history and uses historical materials. So I'm wondering if you could talk about using historical materials in both of your artistic and political work that you've done. Um, sure, I can talk about this, especially, um, I wish everybody could see this. Uh, I wrote a play called Schumer Shabbos and nobody's seen it yet, you know, because of events. Um, and uh, the play is both about historical materials and our relationship to them, um, which is to me, you know, the sort of ultimate, ultimate, uh, it's maybe a little bit narcissistic even because it's about the experience of us being Yiddishists and what all of us do to some extent. And that's realized through the character of a grad student who is at a university in New York and she is studying Yiddish theater and it takes place in 2000 when things were a little bit different. And um, it's about her experience with having uh, an idea in her head of what Yiddish theater was, let's say in Poland in the 30s, and then researching it and maybe not doing so well in the academy. And then she finds out there, there is a 90 year old uh, Yiddish actress living down the street from her. And she decides that she is going to uh, get this woman, this actress to be uh, an informant for her. Uh, and through that process, we learn about her immersion into the world of Yiddish research and the difficulties of, that that presents, and also the difficulties of person-to-person uh, -person transmission. Um, how do you get people to trust you? And how do you ask the right questions? And the anxiety that the transmission that you want to happen, the relationships you want to build with all the grandparents you didn't have, which I think is something a lot of people have felt, you, you're, as soon as you start thinking about that, the anxiety is enormous that these people are not going to be here that long. And what if I don't get to them in time? And what if I, my Yiddish isn't good enough? And they don't understand me and I don't ask the right questions. Um, it's, it's really fraught. Uh, and so I use the play and the relationship between these two very different people to explore some of those things. And so there's some fun stuff for me, you know, in the play, the grad student talks about things like the uh, lexicon, um, you know, there are a couple of these lexicons, one is for Yiddish literature and one is for Yiddish theater. And so when she meets this woman, you know, she looks her up in the lexicon and she's not there. So she has to figure out why the, the actress Sonia is not in that lexicon. Um, so for me, that was part of the way of both uh, making that into art of, of that process of research and historical materials into art, but also grappling with the problems that it raises and the difficulties. In my case, um, before I started composing original music in Yiddish, and even while I was doing that, nearly all of my work was specifically with historical materials. My very first tangible brush with a book in Yiddish was in the stacks of the New York Public Library of the Performing Arts, um, where I accidentally left my, my passport because that was the only um, form of identification that I had in order to be let into the library, but I lost a passport and gained an entire language. So I think it was a, uh, a good trade in the long run. Um, that was my first tangible brush with uh, a Yiddish object, but as far as music in Yiddish is concerned, the Florida Atlantic University Judaica Sound Archives was absolutely crucial in my development of um, consciousness around what the breadth of music in Yiddish actually was, which was immense and huge. Um, various styles of performing Yiddish that were at my disposal um, various kinds of Yiddish repertoire. Um, and like beyond that, um, it's always been about using historical materials. Um, Sidor Belarski has a large archive at Brigham Young University. So I had to call it Brigham Young University probably sometime around 2011, 2012 in order to figure out what was there because I was looking for a particular song. Um, I'm always looking for songs. He has a rather large discography and a lot of the songs that he sang 
um, do not have sheet music attached to them. So it's always a little bit of a hunt to find um, more repertoire. Um, what's really crucial, and I think Rachel to a certain degree um, sort of described this, is that I have an ongoing relationship, um, a casual relationship with a number of academics whose work I interact with um, in my conversations, my PMs, my DMs, uh, emails. There's an ongoing conversation kind of uh, about um, and around Yiddish language and culture that's always going on. Sometimes it's going on quite um, visibly on Twitter, or on Facebook. Um, and that is a way in which um, historical materials that other people are working on sometimes enter my own work or brings up a particular subject that I decided I want to do a little bit more investigating on. And I know that we often see these gems of Yiddish culture are um, usually re relegated to academics, but you too as non-academics, you know, try to be inspired and incorporate these and you're not the only ones. I know there's a certain clothing line that came out recently, <laughs> um, but I'm wondering if you could speak to the obligations you believe using these material materials and tales. <sighs> so I want to go back to something that was brought up a little bit before about how Yiddish introduces you to this international community and it's an international enterprise. And studying Yiddish was to me so transformative because it made me realize that I'm an American Jew. And I think that that can be really hard to understand if you're not really thinking about it, you can think, oh, well, the kind of Jewishness that I, experience, I encounter every day, this is Jewishness, but like, it's really, really helpful to understand that American Jewishness is historically contingent and studying Yiddish has done that for me. And in the same way, but that's good because I can, I understand if I understand what it is to be an American Jew, that means that I understand American Jews better in a way. Um, and also because I'm not an academic, but I have, like Anthony, I have many, many friends who are academics and who see, who see the past, who see history, who see these projects, these ongoing projects through an academic lens. Um, it can really help me understand the interplay between the academic world, what happens in the academic world and what happens everywhere else. It really heightens that. And it's fine that there's that there are two different worlds. Not everybody's going to be an academic. I'm certainly not an academic. Um, but by understanding the differences between those two things, those two worlds, I can also bring them together and understand why in, for, in some ways they're they're so separated. Um, so that's also been really helpful that not only do I learn about, I learn from my friends who are academics and I learn from the work that's going on there, but I can better understand how to educate people who are not academics and bring all these kinds of new ways of understanding the world, these new kinds of knowledge into the non-academic world. Um, that's and, totally, yeah. that's totally it because I feel like there are certain perennial subjects that come up as topics of Jewish conversation and sometimes that conversation is international and sometimes that conversation is, is just national, it's just amongst American Jews and what this sort of ongoing relationship that I think the both of us have with academics allows us to do is to be able to create context and also continuities between uh, these various perennial topics of conversation and the historical record. Um, what culture also allows us to do and kind of the dissemination of culture um, is to create a space for all of us to sift through these continuities and sift through these connections that we have with history and with culture. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we are very much still a part of the same world that created this gorgeous flourishing of Yiddish culture in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, the charge that one gets seeing a historic picture of a sign in Yiddish at a labor union rally 
is because the things that are being protested against are still an issue. Um, the ability to fight against the erosion of um, rights in the concept of labor unions is still something that is a, is a pressing concern. So I think what our interactions with academics and with archives and with that kind of thing allows us to put these ongoing issues into historical context, but to also elucidate the fact that we are still in this moment. This moment has not ended. Like the signs might have rolled up and they might be, you know, off in an office somewhere, but if you unroll them and you translate them, you'll find in many ways they still are very relevant. The things that they address are very relevant. And this goes for not just for signs, but for novels, plays, books, songs, the entirety of, of, of things in Yiddish culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I started to notice, you know, 20 years ago when I started my first steps in doing this work was that because Yiddish, the study of Yiddish had been marginalized for so long that it had kind of left the field open to people who didn't approach the subject necessarily with as much thoughtfulness. Uh, and I won't name these people, um, although I have in the past. Uh, but I think that um, what Anthony points out, that that urgency that once you start studying this stuff, you, you are so much better able to make the connections, to see the relevance the, today. And what I find lacking in some of these works, which I criticize for their shoddy scholarship, it's not just the sc shoddy scholarship, but the, the inability to make those connections, to see the, those through lines to today, and, and then to, to make something that's really useful. Uh, because when you, you know, if you're just regurgitating the kind of half truths of the past, then you, you just wasted an opportunity and you made it harder for the next person who comes along who actually wants to create something good. And I want to bring up something else, which I've just been thinking about. Um, a friend of mine, maybe some people saw this on Twitter, a friend of mine actually <laughs> emailed uh, Noam Chomsky uh, because there was this whole thing about Noam Chomsky being interviewed on a podcast. God bless him. And, uh, you know, he, my friend wanted to know if Noam Chomsky had any feelings on wrestling. And I thought this was funny. And then I thought, actually, there's a question I have for Noam Chomsky about something having to do with the Yiddish world with somebody who's now deceased, who he was friends with. And in all the literature, I've never seen him, I've never seen this address, like nobody's gone and interviewed him. And I thought, you know, if he's so open to being interviewed and he answers emails immediately, I thought, I'll, I'll shoot an email to Noam and see what he has to say. But, you know, I actually, 10 years ago, I would have done it in a second. And today I, 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 I paused for a second because I thought this is important. If nobody else has done this, I'm taking the step of creating a historical record and maybe nobody else will ever have the opportunity. And I thought, hmm, you know, I don't want to waste this. I want to make sure I do this right. I, I emailed my friend Coleman Weiser, who uh, is probably like the, you know, foremost authority on a subject related to what I want to question Noam Chomsky about. And I, you know, I put it to him. I said, should I do this? You know, um, and he said, absolutely. And I thought, all right, <laughs> I'll go ahead. But I was really struck by the weight of still what we're doing in the Yiddish world, because there's so much that has not been addressed. Anybody can go in and create a historical record. And that's a big responsibility. Okay, these have been great answers. And just to give you time to fully answer, I'll only ask two more questions, and then we can do a Q&A, but I'll, I'll try to make them good ones. So both of you have not only worked in the Yiddish cultural space, um, but also kind of combined that with um, activism. I mean, you can define it how you'd like, uh, you can talk about that, but um, work in the greater Jewish community and, and the country at large. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the connection between your Yiddish involvement and your work to affect change in the American Jewish community? So Yiddish has been my primary platform for having anything to say to the American Jewish community as a monolith anyway, which has been interesting because um, of course it has been conveyed to me that it's a very small platform that actually in many ways has 
um, no relationship to the American Jewish community. And I'm always <laughs> sticking myself out there and being like, well, but wait, like uh, mm, I just read something or I just had a thought. Um, so it's interesting. I was talking to Rachel and I think to you, Sarah, about this. No, I was talking to Rachel about it the other day um, that when I sort of embarked on this project of combining 100 years of African-American and Ashkenazi Jewish music and texts, uh, it was essentially a, a personal project. I wanted to create a space in which these two groups of text were in conversation with each, with each other and sort of illuminating each other's images um, and broadening the world of the worlds that they were uh, respectively portraying. And it felt like a very internal um, externalizing really that I was doing. I did not feel like it had any sort of political valence, um, but the personal is political. So of course it did. And it was looked on as being for many people um, a political document, which was a little bit of a shocker to me at, at one at some point because I was like, no, this is like about me. This is a conversation I'm having with respective parts of myself. Um, but what it has allowed me to do is talk about kind of these historic interactions between um, Jews and Black people, between Jewishness and Blackness, which is really of great interest to me, specifically Jewishness and Blackness, because um, Jewishness and Blackness are, a are pervasive and able to kind of overcome borders in which people would like to put them. Um, so me sort of sifting through this phenomenon of, of Jewishness and Blackness being these kind of amorphous things that move in and out of culture um, and physical space has allowed me to address um, the present day relationship between Black people and Jews and to um, really investigate these narratives that um, Black people and Jews have about each other as monoliths, what our responsibilities are to each other, um, where our narratives interact, where they diverge. Um, and having a strong basis in expression of the Yiddish language has really given me this sort of platform to really bring my knowledge in that and kind of enrich this conversation with literal language and culture. Yeah. Um, so I think what both Anthony and I are both really interested in is expanding this idea of what what it means to be political and to make political art um, and political work. Um, you know, there are some people who, if there are some people who might look at Yiddish and politics and say, okay, well, um, I'm looking in the Yiddish past and I'm really interested in Bundism and I want to identify as a Bundist or I want to identify as a Yiddish anarchist and, you know, or I want to identify as a Yiddish Poilitzian left, you know, Zionist. And I think those are all, I understand those. And um, I don't think that those can be interesting paths to take. I would just say that don't, don't limit yourself to the, a very narrow field of what politics and being political and using these using these materials in a political way, what those things can mean can be quite broad and oftentimes um, it's not obvious, right? So this is one of the things that I've been work working on for a while is thinking about how to use theoretical work that's been done not in the Yiddishist world, thinking about how Jews have been constructed as a subject or an object of Western scientific knowledge and deconstructing that, right? So the piece that I read at the top of this program about Kvelin to me is that is itself is uh, using Yiddish and using my Yiddish knowledge for a political project, which is to unpack the way that Jews have, American Jews have constructed themselves 
through language in the United States and, and using Yiddish and how Yiddish has been transformed and how we can then go back and undo that and remake that if we want to. Um, but again, you have to go all the way back to understanding how, what the positionality of Jews, for example, Jews in Europe, what that was, how they were seen, how Jews changed themselves to become part of that machine that produced knowledge and that kind of double consciousness. And again, I think that studying Yiddish really, one of the things it gave me was this heightened sense of, of doubleness, of, of, of double consciousness, of knowing that, knowing very firmly that I am American and how I'm not Eastern European, you know, or very little of it. And then I've had to learn those ways, but that's really good because now I understand it and I can see it very clearly or more clearly than I could before. Ashkenazi American Jews are in a very unusual sort of um, position historically because among white American ethnics, it feels unusual to encounter as much messaging or so much narrative around the historical political leanings of one's ethnicity as one does as an American Jew. So because of that, you often get this uh, phenomenon of um, American Jews and the Yiddish language being very close and adjacent to a progressive political identity. And I think when you have the ability to be able to um, contextualize why that is, it makes it much easier to, to not only resist these very facile narratives around the Yiddish language, but to enrich your knowledge of, of when those things actually do converge. When there is a, a, a Yiddish language politically progressive identity, which is expressing itself through a piece of culture or a piece of history, um, you're actually doing well by it as opposed to kind of using it in this very reductive fashion to express what your short-term political ideas might happen to be. I think Rachel and I are both big fans of, of contextualizing um, and, or, if one is going to decontextualize, to do it with a purpose in order to encourage people to actually go back and recontextualize whatever it is that we have decontextualized, if that's not being too. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Yes, thank you. And just one final question before the Q&A, but kind of a two-parter. I'm wondering, first of all, if there are people here who might be come interested or already be somewhat involved with the Yiddish world, what advice would you give to young activists or artists from a variety of backgrounds to get involved or more involved? And then finally, how would you like to change the Yiddish world of today to be more accessible and, and intersectional and welcoming to these young people who want to get involved? Mm. So I want to push back a little bit on that second question because um, one really needs to consider whether aspects of intersectionality haven't already existed in Yiddish culture and don't necessarily have to be brought to it. Um, and that requires a lot of reading and that requires a lot of listening and that requires a lot of research. So that would be like my short answer is that if you're interested, jump in and really try to find people who are doing this work and find ways to interact with them um, as far as the Yiddish language and culture world is concerned, I always say I'm, I'm not one person away. I'm literally like one finger away from any other person in the world because it's such a small, you know, a, a welt mit weltlech. It's like, a, so it's this tiny little group of people who, who have these interests and who actively kind of work um, in the subject. Um, what, the only way in which I would want to sort of change what happens to be at the moment is to ask people to really in their idea of what Yiddish is, what Yiddish does and where Yiddish belongs to really broaden their horizons. Um, because there's as much messaging about where Yiddish belongs and what Yiddish is outside of Yiddish um, as there is inside of Yiddish. I think in some parts of the Yiddish world, it's very hermetic um, and the idea is that what goes on in the world and conversations that happen in the world um, don't necessarily apply to Yiddish. Um, this is 
wildly ahistorical as far as the production of Yiddish language and culture is concerned. Um, so that's my Tzvei Kopikas. Those are my, that's my two cents um, concerning those questions. Um, I wanted to just bring in the previous question about, you know, academia and, and artists and activists. And I think that although I always, I feel, you know, I'm always struggling with the sense that I don't know enough, I'm not an academic, I haven't, you know, dived in and, and really mastered this or that. And, and it can be, it, it can be really uh, depressing when all of your friends are, uh, you know, scholars and are so deeply immersed. And, you know, if you are, you know, going, more superficially and learning things, a lot of things on a less deep level. But I will say that one of the great things about not being an academic is that you're not under the same pressure that they are to appear neutral, right? And as much as things have changed in academia in the last couple of years, still there's a sense that when you're a scholar, you're committed to the facts. If you're a historian, you're not trying to find, you know, an outcome, but you're going to the archive to see what the facts are and you're drawing conclusions from there. Um, and especially in the world of Yiddish, I think one of the reasons Yiddish suffered for so long in this country is that there was a sense that um, if Jews worked on Yiddish, they would be dismissed as partisan, that they would be dismissed as boosters. It was not serious and that you were just doing it because, you know, it was who you were, it was part of your identity. And, you know, that's changed, but still I, there, there are a lot of issues around that. Whereas if you're not in academia, you're not that's not an issue. It's not something you necessarily have to think about. I'm a capital Y Yiddishist, which I have my own definition for that. And I, so people know right away what my agenda is. <laughs> I mean, they don't, but they think they do. Um, so uh, my advice to young activists or people who want to be in the Yiddish world is certainly to learn as much as you can. Absolutely. And if you feel like if you're academically inclined and you want to get a PhD and you understand all the, you know, difficulties that that entails today, certainly go for it. But we are truly in the beginnings of a golden age of Jewish scholarship or Renaissance and Jewish studies and especially everything to do with Eastern Europe and Yiddish. I mean, just in the last 20 years, it's mind blowing how much has been done. So, you know, you learning now and diving into whatever is so much easier than it would have been 20 years ago. And whatever you're interested in, the resources are there, you know, go and do it, go and learn. And the people are there and they're, the networks are there. What I would like to change about the Yiddish world, I mean, first of all, it's depressing that it's still, there are still a lot of financial barriers to things like in summer intensives, you know, it's just, it's really depressing. It's very expensive. Not everybody can do it. Not, very, not everybody can take a summer off. All these things um, that feel really, that create exclusionary barriers. And they were there when I started and they're still there today. Um, you know, there's, there's now more accessible tools and whatnot, but still th those barriers remain. And I really hope that going forward in the next couple of years, we'll see more of an integration of Yiddish into earlier and earlier stages of Jewish education in general. So it'll just be something that's available to people that they don't have to struggle for. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much for answering my questions. And I'd like to invite people to put questions in the chat and um, I can pose them with your name or if you'd like to ask me to ask them anonymously, you can write that you want to be anonymous. And um, while people are writing questions in the chat, I'd like to invite Anthony and Rachel if they have anything they want to plug or where we can find your work or share anything that you have coming up, uh, please do so with us. Anthony, do you want to start? Huh. It's, what do I have to plug? Well, I do have my album, Convergence. Um, it is, um, so it has sort of been the model for a lot of the work that came after it. I have my website, Anthony Russell Bass, that's B A S S dot com. And that's where I pretty much present any sort of projects that uh, I've been working on. Um, 
following me on Twitter is actually um, an interesting experience because I do a lot of my thinking actually uh, about any number of subjects, including Yiddish and Yiddish culture out loud on Twitter. Um, I have a somewhat influential uh, thread about uh, the shtetl in the wake of the shtetl clothing um, line brouhaha of the, the previous week. Um, I talked about my experiences in Belarus and Poland uh, being in former shtetlach. Um, and I think it was educational for a certain group of people who did not have that physical experience of Jewish space in Eastern Europe, which was so crucial for me to gain in order to really have an idea about what I was working with um, and what I was invoking or what I was not invoking. Um, my screen name there is Mordechetsvi. Good luck trying to spell that, but um, I'm relatively easy to find. There's not a lot of Black people in the Yiddish game, as I always say. I'm always exactly one Google search away. <laughs> so have at it. Uva, as they say. Um, so what I'm working on right now is I'm very excited. I'm going to be taking part in the JCC of Vancouver's upcoming Chutzpah Festival of New Jewish Art. And my play Shemr Shabbos is gonna be featured there as a work in progress. So we're not gonna be doing the whole play, but uh, we'll be doing a program on November 22nd, uh, Shin is for Shemr Shabbos, which is going to be a program about the play. There's gonna be some excerpts from the play as well as some uh, chat about the creation of the play. And I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. There's gonna be some Dybbuk based materials because November and December, we see the, um, 100th York site of Shinansky, and then in December, it's the 100th anniversary of the premiere of the Yiddish version of the Dybbuk by the Vilna Truppe. Um, so it's going to be a real special time of the year, and the Dybbuk plays uh, an important role in my play because the actress in my play, Sonia, uh, was an actress in the Warsaw Yiddish scene, and the play that she was in, this famous play, Strummer Shabbos, was itself kind of a, an attempt to cash in, if you will, a little bit on the phenomenal success of the Divic. So that's November 22nd. Wonderful. Okay. A few people have messaged questions to me privately. Um, so first we have a question that I'll combine with another maybe. So there's an, um, do you have any recommendations for starting to read about Yiddish history for resources that are both accessible, but also trustworthy? And then also, do you just have a favorite piece of Yiddish music or literature? And yes, what can you recommend us? Mm. Okay. So I will say that my very favorite resource is always the Yivo Encyclopedia Online. And I have been shocked oftentimes to see the kind of stuff people put out there when the correct information is literally one click away. All you gotta do is go to the Yivo Encyclopedia, it's free. Type in shtetl, <laughs> see what it has to say. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, it's not a single, well, I mean, it is, it's, it's a couple volumes, but I mean, you, you know, it's all free, it's all there at the Yivo Encyclopedia. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, and, you know, my favorite Yiddish work, my gosh, there is so much, of course, always Mickey Katz, which is really Yinglish, um, but I just, I love the hell out of that man. I mean, he was so brilliant and so funny and the musicians he brought together, like, you know, we always, when, when we come together at places like Class Canada or wherever, and I know that we probably always, you know, we all have the same reaction, Sarah and Anthony, that like how lucky we are to be surrounded by the, in, this incredible assortment of world-class scholars and musicians. And Mickey Katz, even though he did these kind of silly songs, he did that, like he surrounded himself with these amazing world-class studio musicians who just blew the roof off. So, you know, if you're not hip to Mickey Katz, definitely check that out. <laughs> On my end, I would suggest um, some online resources. The aforementioned Florida Atlantic University Judaica Sound Archive, which really is an amazing panoply of a hundred years of Jewish recorded music. Um, so you can get a real tom 
uh, for music in the Yiddish language. There is Itzik Gottesman's uh, Yiddish Song of the Week blog. Oh my God. Which yeah. has been very influential um, in the repertoire that I have acquired. Um, actually, um, I think it's the third or fourth track on, on my album Convergence is called Train. And on uh, I the Yiddish song that I sing in that song on Eisenbahn was a song that I learned from the Yiddish Song of the Week blog. So um, I highly recommend that. I'm a big fan of I.B. Singer. I know that doesn't make me special or to give me a personality, but I'm a really big fan of his work. I'm not enough of a scholar to have read it in Yiddish. I usually read it in translation. Um, I absolutely fell in love with his novel, The Magician of Lublin. And I have repeatedly made the contention, the hot take, um, that Uncut Gems and The Magician of Lublin are parallel stories because they're both stories about um, Jewish men who are running out of time um, and ultimately end up at the very end in very small spaces in which their destinies are ultimately decided. Um, I really, really love um, Ivy Singer. So he's, that, that's something that I would suggest. Just do a lot of reading. And the nice thing about doing a lot of reading is that you will encounter something that makes absolutely no sense. And then you'll start to go down that rabbit hole and all of a sudden you're in an entire world. So those are, those are my suggestions. There. We have a question from Travis at Cornell. I feel like my interest in Yiddish culture was sparked by seeing the importance of cultural continuity in many indigenous cultures and feeling like Yiddish culture is what I was allowed, in quotes, to explore. Do Anthony or Rachel have perspectives on the place of Yiddish as diaspora and how it compares to land-based knowledge? Hmm. Dos is a Shaila. What uh, <laughs> what a serious question. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I think like it would be hard for me to have a definite answer because I think the question that you're asking is something that people have been sifting through for the past 150 years and everybody always comes up with different answers um, and very few of them feel like they're the final answer. So I'm going to see if this question is in the chat because I want to make sure it was such a it's such a complicated question. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, while you're looking, I, I want to bring something up that Anthony, Anthony and I have been talking about, which is that though there's so much now available to us, you know, either in new scholarship in books or virtual resources, nothing can replace the experience of going to these places of going to Eastern Europe. And again, this is something that it costs money, it takes time, all these things. So I'm not saying like, oh, if you haven't done it, you know, you're not a real Yiddishist. However, it's more that there's an understanding. There's, I think that there's a respect that we need to give to the different ways of knowing, different kinds of knowledge that we produce when we do different things. And when you go to a place and you see the landscape, and you see the houses and the architecture that's left. When you see all these things and the traces, um, it creates a knowledge inside of you that is not, that's not like anything else. And if we're talking about the land and the knowledge that the land can give you, that's certainly one very, I would say, very strong aspect to it, to, to understanding what the connection is. Like when we say Ashkenazi, you know, what does that mean? It means so many things. And, and in certain ways, it can be it can produce things that are a little bit uncomfortable if we start relying on things like, oh, well, genetic knowledge of, you know, I'm genetically Ashkenazi. It is, that is extremely problematic. <laughs> um, and it's also problematic. I mean, not every Ashkenazi Jew is from Ashkenaz. However, it's one aspect of it. It's, and it's one aspect that I think cannot be understood or there's something special to that understanding that you can only get from going to the land. I had like a personal experience of what you're talking about because um, one year after the other in 2016, um, the summer of 2016, I was in 
uh, the Yiddish Zuma program um, at Tel Aviv University. So I had my first experience of the Jewish state, which was, let me tell you, a, kind of a lifetime in the making. Um, it was very strange getting on a cab from uh, Ben Gurion Airport and passing a road sign that said Jerusalem, knowing that any number of ancestors of mine have had the name Jerusalem on their lips never really had an, a, an ability to see it. So that was one experience I had. And then exactly a year later, I went to Belarus and Poland. So I, one could say that um, maybe I did it backwards um, <laughs> historically, um, or maybe the right way historically, who knows? Anyway, um, I can't begin to describe how important it was for me to have my own experience of Jewish space in order to establish my experiences as being important as anything I had read or picked up in a book or had been told secondhand. Um, it's absolutely priceless. I also feel like it's a little bit perverse though for me to, to talk about how priceless it is when we can't really go anywhere right now. <laughs> um, and I need you to understand that that has felt like a crisis to me because so much of how I've oriented myself as a performer in Yiddish has involved um, creating a space for Yiddish in other countries and in other places um, that aren't where I live. Um, so this is, I mean, they talk about unprecedented times. I know it's a complete, you know, we're tired of hearing that, but it really is. And if you ever do get an, a chance, um, to kind of inhabit these spaces. And where these spaces are, are various. I mean, I'm thinking about the shul that I went to on uh, the Lower East Side. And when you walk into the shul, there are all of these beautiful murals of the Zodiac oh um, for each um, month of the Jewish year. And that, once again, is kind of the establishment of Jewish space. You can go there and you can touch it and you can see it and you can figure out exactly what your relationship is to it, both in space and in time. And I think that these experiences are, are priceless. And if you can manage to have one, and yeah. sometimes that could just be talking to another person who's had it, um, do it, go for it. Yeah, I wanna add one more thing that um, last night, when I, to fall asleep, I, I often listen to a favorite ghost podcast of mine, which is, sounds kind of weird, but it's people call in and they tell their ghost stories. And it's weirdly very relaxing. And last night I was shocked awake though, because it was a caller from Poland who lives in the former area of the former Jewish ghetto in Warsaw. It, he's not a non-Jewish guy. And uh, he was talking about the ghost that was in his apartment in the, uh, in the former Jewish ghetto and that he felt it was a Jewish ghost. And I, boy, I was not feeling sleepy. <laughs> but my, it reminded me that, again, one of these experiences that has been so transformative for me as a Yiddishist has been going, first of all, going to Eastern Europe and meeting non-Jews who do Yiddish and who care deeply about the Jewish past in Eastern Europe. I, I mean, it, it's up there with, you know, the top, you know, three experiences of my life of really transforming the way I understood myself and I understood my own history. Um, it's so powerful. And of course, you know, there are a lot of Eastern European students who come to the Evo Zuma program every year. So even if you just do the Evo program, you'll, you'll meet them there too. Um, but I think there's something really, really important to going there and seeing what local activists are doing, especially if you have like a hometown that, you know, you want to go back to and meeting them, meeting the people who take care of Jewish cemeteries. I mean, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Um, not just the people who are worried about the ghosts that are going to come back and haunt them because of the sins of their ancestors, although that's also interesting. I'd like to talk to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially, he's also trying to figure out what his relationship is to Jewish space. Like he might living, he might be living in one, and maybe you know, he should have worked out the terms beforehand. We don't know. Yeah, well, and maybe maybe he'll get that Ouija board out. I don't know. I'd like to be there. I'd like to be involved. Maybe I'll get in touch. <laughs> Call me. <laughs>
Are you talking? Are you talking to the ghost? Actually, <laughs> I thought <laughs> I was like, talking to Marek, the guy who called. But maybe I'm talking to the ghost too. It. I don't know. Okay, got it. We'll see. You have to do a three-person Zoom like we did. You, Mark, yeah. and the ghost. <laughs> okay, so just one final question from Professor Cami, which I think is important since this topic is about progressive Yiddish culture. Um, is there? Do you have anything you can tell us about? Okay, let's see what he said. Um, most speakers born into Yiddish today would not necessarily understand the relationship between. Yiddish and progressive political culture. Are there ways to bridge the world between progressive Yiddish culture and maybe what's called reactionary or traditional Yiddish culture? Uh, and are, they, are there ways to bridge these two worlds that we rarely speak to each other, save for refugees from one world to the other? I, I'd like to posit that this is a very deliberate and false sort of distinction because before relatively recently, I don't think that these were necessarily boundaries that were made. I don't know, Rachel, what do you think? This concept of traditional Yiddish culture and progressive Yiddish culture, as if one was not in, in well, no, please go ahead. Well, you know, even going back 100, 120 years, there were people, you know, Yiddishists, you know, Shinansky, right, people who left their Jewish place, if it wasn't a shuttle, it was a city, and then, you know, went to Switzerland, and they, and they, or they went to the miners, or whatever, like, you know, Shinansky had to go through all these steps to alienate himself from his background, and then make that return. Right. So there was, you know, there, there's always been the, the creation of modern Yiddish culture is about leaving, leaving the shtetl and then and, and having a, a conscious becoming a self-conscious Yiddishist or become it's self-consciously using Yiddish. So I, I, I agree with you that there, there there's a danger of making these kind of, you know, artificial binaries. But I would say that rather than consciously trying to bridge that and saying we're going to teach you know these you know Hasidic Yiddish speakers about what progressive Yiddish culture is if you're interested in having those conversations making those people welcome then make your what you do make your project accessible right it's all about accessibility and we're all thinking about these kind of things these days accessibility whether it's financial or it's uh physical do you have a ramp you know, is it, is there childcare there? All these things. So, you know, think about the way that you talk about Hasidic Yiddish. Do you erase Hasidic Yiddish speakers when you speak about contemporary Yiddish? All these things, I know that there are Hasidic speaking, uh, Yiddish speaking Hasidim out there who are watching, they're listening, they notice how you speak about them. Uh, and so there is, there is a separation there, but if you're interested in bridging that, think about how you are making your project accessible to them at a very basic level. At the risk of repeating myself, I think it's important to figure out if what you're looking for already has existed mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> in, in Yiddish before one assumes that one necessarily has, has to express oneself from outside of a tradition or outside of a precedence. Um, it's there and it's complicated because it's not just something that exists outside of people, but it's things that exist inside of people. Um, and these two kinds of ways of, of being um, Yiddish, being Yiddish, it's like such a strange construction, I hope you'll forgive me. These two ways of being Yiddish in the world are often in relationship to each other and only make sense in context with each other. Um, I warned that I was going to bring this up and I am going to bring this up, but uh, yesterday I saw on Netflix um, the trial of the Chicago Seven. And one of the things that they left out was this really kind of iconic moment where Abby Hoffman called Judge Hoffman uh, a Shanda Fadigoyim. And then afterwards at a press conference had a chalkboard and wrote it out, an extremely vibey, non-Yivo transliteration. Um, so here's the question, like, is his use of that phrase, where does that come from? Does it come from traditional Yiddish? Does it come from a history of progressive 
political Yiddish? Was it an aspect of himself that he used in a political moment in order to make a very nuanced point? Was he trying to express the difference between uh, Judge Hoffman, who, you know, at least in the movie was kind of portrayed as a very sort of assimilated person, and himself as a, uh, somebody who was unable to really be that assimilated. I mean, he really could have just said, you know, you're you're ashamed of our people, but no, he said a shanda fadagoyim. Like he just like those were the terms in which he felt comfortable in saying that. Like, what does what does that mean? I think for me, it's kind of an avatar of how sort of potentially integrated these ways of being in the world are. Um, and more complicated than they are often presented as being. I hope that makes sense. It's like something I've been talking about for, oh my God, like a little bit more than 12 hours. So <laughs> since I saw it on Netflix yesterday, so. Well, thank you both so much for speaking to us. Um, and thank you to the people that asked questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but I hope I combined some of them in ways where most people were covered. Um, thank you to the Jewish Studies Department, the Center for Religious Life for um, sponsoring us, the Smith College Jewish Community to co-sponsoring us with our event. Um, and I know we had at max a little over 60 people and then some people were in and out so maybe 70 up to 75 people who came so i really appreciate it and um, i hope this showed you all what uh, smith college is uh can do and uh, we appreciate you coming and uh, i hope everyone is well sidekizent thank you sarah what an honor to be invited it really what a pleasure this has been lovely it really could have gone on much longer so keep that in <laughs> mind later <laughs> If folks, if folks want to unmute and applaud our guests, that would be, this would be a great time to do so and or unmute your videos and applaud. Thank you so much to both of you and to Sarah, our wonderful moderator. Yes, we have to thank you, Sarah. You've really done an amazing job of kind of pulling all of this together. Um, and it's very pertinent. Like this is a conversation that people are having all the time. So the fact that there's a program that speaks to that is very, I'm excited. Well, we'll put it on YouTube and you guys can, you know, if you missed any of it or anything, it'll be there. Great.